We are at the Rock House Haven. It's a Kalapa House project and we are here to listen to Paul Vogt tell us some amazing stories. The story I want to share with you now is, is a very personal story close to my heart. It's about uh, my first childhood sweetheart. Uh, Paula lived right across the street from me since I was 11 years old. In junior high, uh, we became boyfriend and girlfriend. It was puppy love, but it's real to the puppies. But by the time we got into high school, we actually became more like brother and sister. And when I transferred out to the university, uh, after a couple of weeks, she missed me so much, she transferred out to the same university. She says, now what are we going to tell people when we get here? Because we're so physical with each other, they're going to think we're boyfriend and girlfriend. And I said, yeah, I know, because we tickle each other on the lawn and we chase each other and we tackle each other and jump on each other. So she said, let's just tell them we're twins, Paul and Paula. That was actually our song back in the 60s. So we did. She got there. We told people we were twins, Paul and Paula. And we knew each other's stories since we were 11 years old, so we could match all the stories up. And so we went to the university together. She was on the dean's list, very smart. And after we finished that year there, I moved down to Arizona. She moved back up to Alaska. She couldn't decide what she wanted to do. Her mom said, well, listen, why don't you go run for a beauty contest and get some scholarship money, and that will pay for more of your schooling. Not that they really needed the money because her family were multimillionaires. But anyway, she said, you know, that'll be something fun to do. I, I can go ahead and do that. So she, she ran for Miss Alaska, and uh, she won. And this is a picture of Paula with her crown and the official state costume uh, as Miss Alaska. Well, things started becoming very exciting for Paula. And Paula and I had a little secret that we made to each other. We said, you know, if we get in our older years and we're both widowed or divorced and alone, that we wouldn't let the other one stay alone and we would marry each other and we would travel the world together. So that was our little secret that nobody knew, that uh, we would not be alone in our senior years. Anyway, Paula decided, you know, this is kind of fun. Uh, I think I'll open up my own modeling agency. Because of her family's wealth, they helped finance her own agency. And so Paula became a professional model. This is a picture of her as, as Miss Alaska. And uh, this is her model worksheet uh, where they have her in, in different poses so that a corporation or a, an idea would see if uh, that she would have the image that they're looking for. Uh, for the agency and uh, she had people working for her and uh, life became very exciting for Paula. Then she received a job offer to work in the White House in the United States Senate because of her family's political connections. They got her the job to work in Washington DC <laughs> and now she was among of course the most powerful people of the world and she saw these people uh, as they came through the White House and uh, got to meet some of them and uh, life was getting more and more exciting for Paula. Well in the meantime I had become baptized and after my baptism, I went back up to Alaska, started sharing with my family and friends what I had learned. And of course, I walked right across the street to Paula's house like I did since I was 11 years old. I said, Paula, look what I found. And she goes, wow, this is really interesting. I never heard this before. I said, I know. I said, I hadn't either. But isn't this something? And she goes, man, this is really good. So she started coming to church with me. We started studying the Bible together. And then she says, listen, I've got to do some magazine ads in Los Angeles. I'll be right back. You keep praying for me. She'd take off and she'd come back and we'd study some more. And then she says, listen, I've got to do some newspaper ads in New York. I'll be right back. Keep praying. I'd pray. She'd take off. And uh, finally she said, I've got to go back to Washington, D.C. Well, I knew when she went to Washington, D.C. she'd be gone six months to a year back to work. And so I continued to pray for Paula. Then I moved down to Arizona, still praying for Paula. And then one day I received uh, this little card from Paula. It says, Dearest Paul, just a note to let you know that I'm busy and happy. I have accepted Christ as my Savior. I feel so good, safe, and secure with God. Now this next statement is profound. I pray I will learn to love God and others as He wants me to. Wow, she got it. Well, when Paula turned about 30 years old, she started developing some serious complications with her diabetes. Her parents sent her to the best medical research centers around the nation. Money was no object. And every time she would go to another medical center, she would ask to speak to the people in the terminal ward, people who were dying of cancer, leukemia. She would go and she would pray with them, talk to them about the Lord. President Reagan found out what she was doing, and he sent her a personal letter from the White House to encourage her, even though she was sick, she was reaching out to those who were dying at the hospital. 
At 33, she ended up at the University of Michigan Medical Center where they had developed some new experimental surgeries on the pancreas to try to help it to de develop the ins de 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 deliver the insulin. But after the surgeries, they said, Paula, there's no more medical science can do. You're going to die. She said, then let me speak one last time to the people at the hospital. So they gathered together in a very large room, doctors, nurses, patients, and she came in and she had on her crown Miss Alaska and she also had the letter from President Reagan. And she brought in on a wheelchair, she held up the letter from the President of the United States and she said, this letter means nothing to me without having Jesus in my life. She put it on the floor. Then she removed her crown, Miss Alaska, and she put that on the floor. And she said, this crown means nothing without Jesus in my life. She pointed to the windows and she said, outside there, they're all running around like there's no tomorrow, chasing after money, chasing after power, chasing after fashion. I know I was out there. It was kind of like what Jeremiah warned us about, what Paula was saying. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches. You see, Paula had all that to boast about, didn't she? Power, money, riches. She was an outstanding student at university. But Jeremiah says in verse 24, that him who boasts, boasts in this, that he knows and understands the Lord. And Paula got that right. It was not the money, the fashion, the power, the riches, all the beauty. It was knowing Jesus. That was important. She told the people there at the hospital, I'm going home now to die. And I will never see some of you again. But if you will accept Jesus as your Savior, I will see you again in a place where there will be no more hospitals, no more doctors, no more pain or suffering. They turned her wheelchair around, flew her back up to Alaska, set up her bedroom to be as comfortable as possible because she didn't want to die in the hospital. Around the clock nurses were with her to try to take care of her. She weighed less than 90 pounds. Most of her hair had fallen out. She was no longer the beautiful Miss Alaska that she once was. But you know she had a crown of life from Jesus that no beauty pageant could ever give her. Every day she would sit in her room and she would read her Bible and she would pray, especially for her mother. Paula was her only daughter and had a very close mother-daughter relationship. And she knew this was soon going to be over. So she prayed for her mother. And then because of more complications from the diabetes, she went completely blind. And she saw that as God's final blessing. Now how could going blind at the end be a blessing? Mom, could you please read the Bible for me? Her mother said, I'd be happy to. And every day, Paula's mom would come in and sit in her room. She'd read the Bible to her, page after page, chapter after chapter. And Paula would pray, Dear God, touch my mother's heart. Help her to go through our final goodbye. And one Thursday morning, Paula breathed her last. Her mother walked across the room, reached underneath, held her one last time, and she cried, My baby my baby. I have accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I will see you again in a place where there will be no more pain, no more suffering. And I made a promise in my heart that everywhere in the world I traveled, I would share Paula's story. Mm -hmm. Trying to help people understand what Paula knew. It's not the money, it's not the fashion, it's not the power that's important. It's knowing Jesus. And if Paula were here, that's exactly what she would tell you. Don't get caught up in the stuff out there. It's not important. It's knowing Jesus. I believe one day when Jesus comes back, you're going to meet my twin, Paula. <laughs> and you're going to be able to tell her, I know your story. Because I want to share that because she can't share it anymore.